<laughs> now, I don't think the adults slept so well, but uh, it's a lot easier with the kids sleeping. All right, open your Bibles this morning to John's Gospel, chapter 12, as we continue our study in the book of John. Uh, we have come to a topic that I am very passionate about. In fact, I am coming to believe that this, this is the essence of Christianity, of living the Christian life. And the topic that we're going to be looking at from, from this text is the subject of worship. And I, I want to get right into it, but I'm going to hold myself back till we at least read the text, all right? John chapter 12, beginning verse 1 through verse 8. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burial hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me ye have not. Always. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your great grace and mercy. Thank you for the reminders of that in Landon's sermon this morning. And Lord, the, the reality is all of us who, who know you through the Lord Jesus Christ owe a debt of love that we can never repay. God, to think that you, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of of all, the sustainer of all, the giver of all good things, would come and become a man. And Lord, as Philippians 2 talks about, not just a man, but a servant. And not just a servant, but one who is obedient, and not just one who is obedient, but obedient unto death. Lord, we owe. And, and Lord, we owe again what is humanly impossible to pay. But Lord, at the very least, you are worthy of our worship. And I pray in this message and the next two out of, out of this series, Lord, that you would help us to grasp what it means to worship you. And Lord, that we would understand that, that it, this is our purpose in life. Lord, even the main purpose that you have redeemed us for, and that is to worship you. And Lord, if there's someone here this morning that's not a worshiper, but is in fact a rebel, Lord, help them today to turn their life over to the Lord Jesus Christ in faith and be saved. For his sake we ask it. Amen. John chapter 12 marks the beginning of the end of Christ's life. This brings an end to his public ministry. So in all notes, a, a threefold change in his ministry. First, he changes from public outreach to a private one. He moves from seeking the multitudes to sequestering himself with his disciples. Second, he shifts his emphasis away from miracles and concentrates on quiet, intimate conversation with his 12 men. And that's, that takes up chapters 13 through 17. In fact, the raising of Lazarus is the last miracle until his own resurrection. And third, he reduces his travels returning to Jerusalem and staying there. He's not out evangelizing at this point. He is preparing to leave and preparing the disciples for his departure. 
And this is an incredibly intimate time, an incredibly important time because it gives us a, a glimpse again the heart of a, of a loving, caring Savior. Now the events then beginning in chapter 12 take place during the last week of Christ's life. Seven, a seven day period. Seven short days yet they occupy a great deal of record in not only John's gospel but all the gospels. Nearly one half of John's gospel is given over to a narration of the events of this week and what follows. Two-fifths of Mark's gospel, one-third of Matthew, and one-fourth of Luke's gospel. The events of this week contain what we're looking at this morning, the anointing of Jesus at Bethany, the entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the cursing of the fig tree, the Olivet Discourse, the final discourses with the disciples as recorded by John, the Last Supper, the arrest, the trials, and the crucifixion, and the embalming and burial of the body, and then after three days, the resurrection. The week begins then, as we're seeing in our text this morning, by a supper given by some of the friends of the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course what stands out here is the act of devotion by Mary. It was an uh, unusual yet tender expression. In fact, it is one of four expressions of worship that we find in this chapter. Because of that, I, I want to spend some time today and again in the next two sermons considering the subject of worship from these eight verses. Now the first thing we have to do is understand, you know, when normally in churches when they talk about worship, what are they talking about? The music program, right? Now first thing I have to say is that that may or not may be, may or may not be worship. And I'm not going to define all that this morning. But may I say that worship is so, so, so much more than that. And true worship can't be confined to that single, however few minutes that we have a song service in church. It cannot, it must not be confined to that time. It is too, much too narrow a view of worship. In fact, that's the way I want to begin this morning. I want to look at what worship is not as we consider our text this morning. John does not really tell us all that transpired uh, as he began his journey, uh, he being Jesus, to Jerusalem for the last time. But we learn from the other Gospels what happened. John only tells us that Jesus came to Bethany six days before the Passover, and we see that in verse 1. Now again, this is where Lazarus was, and it was there that they made Jesus a supper. Now we don't know for sure exactly where they are, but we do learn from Matthew and Mark that this supper was held at the house of Simon the leper whom Jesus had healed. I, I think there was a lot of gratitude in that room. I, I just suspect. But this supper was no doubt given to honor the Lord Jesus Christ, a kind of a, a thank you supper of sorts. But at this supper, an unusual event takes place. Some would think that not only was it strange, it was totally out of place. Mary, who was... Martha and Lazarus' sister took a, cont a container of very costly ointment and she broke it and poured it on Jesus, in particular his feet. 
I want you to understand that this is what true worship is all about. And again, we'll say more about that later on. Mary gives lavishly of her costly gift. And she does it for one simple reason. She's not trying to earn her way to heaven. She's not trying to impress the people in the room. She's not trying to maybe get her way into the word of God, which happened. In fact, she's not motivated by any selfish motivation at all. But she's motivated by a supreme love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Her act was typical of true worship. And again, we're going to say a lot more about this later on. But she gave. If you want a simple definition of, of worship, and I don't like definition because they off, often are constricted, but if we had to have a simple definition, this is it. De the definition of worship is giving. In this case, it's giving to the giver. Usually, what do, we, what do we tend to emphasize in our relationship with the Lord? We tend to emphasize what the Lord gives to us. And again, there is that dimension. God is so good. God is so very good to us. And we are dependent upon him. And so it's altogether right that we go to him and we ask him for the things that we need. But worship is not about that. Worship is about our giving to the giver. We need to balance this out so we don't have a one-sided relationship. Well, as we begin to look at this this morning, though, I want you to note that Mary's act of devotion points out several things that worship is not. Okay? Worship is not. Number one, I, I hope I don't lose you this morning, but just stick with me, okay? Worship is not always sane or rational, as people would view it. Think about Mary's actions. Discounting the act of worship, okay? Take that out of the scenario here. Does what she does make sense? Does it make sense? I, I mean, don't we have to, if we looked at it from a logical perspective, why the oil? Why would somebody do that? Why, why the feet why wipe it with your hair? Why do that now? Or as Judas, who is, represents the opposite of worship, asks, why the waste? The first thing then that we learn about worship is that it is not always, again, as people would view it, sane or logical or even, some would say, proper. It's not always reserved. Matter of fact, for someone who doesn't know what's going on here, it would seem outright foolish. Some outside observers might say to or about the one who is authentically worshiping the Lord, and you may have even heard this, don't be so radical. Don't be so foolish. Don't be so involved. Don't be so giving. Don't care so much. 
Don't, you don't have to go to church every time the doors open. You don't have to go visit people in the hospital. You don't have to, you know, just back off a little bit. <laughs> don't get extreme on this. You're getting carried away. I mean, it's okay to believe in Jesus. <clears throat> Just don't do weird stuff. Right? Don't do anything foolish. Here's what we got to do. We got to maintain the status quo. You know, fold your hands and sit neatly. And just don't do anything weird. <coughs> I, I think, personally, this is Mike's opinion, so don't go out of here and say, well, blah, 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 blah. We need some radical Christianity. We need, to, we need some rock the boat Christianity. We need to get past, we need to really be sick of status quo Christianity. I, I love the way that Chuck Swindoll put it in a, in a sermon on serving. He said, we're, so, we're, we're satisfied with about three pounds of God in a paper bag. We want just a little bit of him and a little bit of an expressive relationship, but we don't want those people out there to think we're weird. Do we? I, I hate to say it, but this shows up in our worship services. Have you ever been in a, in a, again, we call them worship services, where you have been overwhelmed by the love of God? I mean overwhelmed. Or by a particular truth of his word. Do you ever really get excited? I mean... It, if there's anything that it should excite us, it should be our relationship with the Lord. We yell at the television when the ball game's on. Mostly at the, at the umpires. Why shouldn't we be sometimes, and again, don't be phony about this. Please, don't be phony about it. But we all got to admit that there are times where we just want to explode because God has so revealed himself to us. But you know what we do? We look around and see what everybody else is doing. Because we don't want them to think we're weird or extreme. Now, I'm not talking about running up and down the aisles and jumping over the pews and that kind of thing. But, you know, sometimes when our hearts are overfilled, we need to express it. And sometimes we need to express it vocally with a, a hearty amen or praise the Lord or thank you, Jesus. I'll do that if everybody else is doing it. I, I think when we get to heaven, it's going to be a little more noisy than we anticipate. Now again, don't get me wrong, because sometimes worship is not expressed that way. Sometimes we are just in our hearts, overwhelmed, and we just want to weep.
I, I've got to mention this. How many of you have seen the movie The Overcom Overcomers yet? <laughs> I, I think I cried through two thirds of it. You're, you're a man, you're not supposed to cry. When people get saved, I cry. I, I just can't help it. But sometimes it's this quiet contemplation. Here, here's the point of worship. In either case, whether it's quiet contemplation, whether it's tears, whether it's vocal, whether it's breaking a box of alabaster oil and pouring it on the feet of Jesus, we can't do that physically. Whatever it is, it is a heart of adoration for the Lord that causes us to lose consciousness of everything else. He's it. He's it. True worship is God-centered. And not at all concerned with what other people think. You're enraptured by the presence of God. And folks, if you haven't been there, you need to go there. Where we just lose total consciousness of everything but Him. I, see, I just had the feeling that Mary wasn't and she's peeking up, looking to see what these people think. She wasn't belligerent, but I think she didn't care what they thought. Brings us second point. Worship's not always reserved. I like what Vance Hammer says. In fact, I love what Vance Hammer says here. He says, our services always start at 11 o'clock sharp and end 12 o'clock dull. Boring, predictable services. I, I, I don't know. I, I, just, I just think we need to be excited. Do we really believe what we believe? That there is a hell out there reaching out from eternity that we were going there, but Jesus saved us. He rescued us. If we really believe that, shouldn't we be excited and expressive and loving and adoring? Sometimes our lives could be described as predictable. Our services as predictable. And, and it's not an indictment on our church all so much as most churches. Most churches. You could remove the Holy Spirit and it would be business as usual. Mary was not at all predictable. I mean, think about it. Who would do that? Who would do that? We're going to talk about all... Well, let's talk about it now. First of all, she's mixing with men. Taboo. Taboo. Strictly taboo. Not only that, but she took her hair down in the presence of men. They didn't do that then, folks. You, you got to understand that that was, that, again, strictly taboo. But she not only unbinds her hair, but she uses it as a towel to wipe the feet of Jesus. More, she can almost hear the Baptists fainting out of their chairs right now, right? Whew. The thought of 
muscle memory with that woman. She got no propriety. She got no dignity. She got no class. Well, one thing becomes clear here about worship. Worship is not ritual, although sometimes we can worship in our rituals. Worship is not form. It's not always proper in its appearance. It is the heart pouring forth devotion sacrifice and adoration, again, without regard of what anybody else thinks. This between me and Jesus. Thirdly, worship is not always conservative. And by conservative, I don't mean in, in propriety that way. We've already dealt with that. But I mean stinginess. I'm, I'm conservative. Go ahead and say it. I'm tight. No, don't say it because you don't want to be that way. But I'm frugal. If you're stingy with the Lord, you're not worshiping him. You're worshiping you. Mary gave very costly oil. Hendrick, Hendrickson said, the essence of this ointment was derived from pure nard, which is an aromatic herb grown in the pasture land of the Himalayas. In view of the fact that it had to be produced in a region so remote and carried on camelback through miles and miles of mountain passes, it was very high Price. In fact, I doubt if any of you have any perfume in your house or oil that would be this expensive. In fact, Judas pegs it worth uh, 300 pence. A pence would be a day's work. So if you took out the Sabbath, this would be a year's labor. That's what this would cost, a whole year's labor. Now just think about what you make in a year. That was in this container. And we're not talking about $20 bottle of perfume here. We're talking about something very, very expensive. It probably represented, you know, they measured wealth in a lot of different ways in animals and and. Uh, jewelry and that kind of thing. This proper, probably represents her life's savings. Her life's savings. And yet, she breaks it and gives it as an act of worship. You know, we ask, how much do I have to give to the Lord? You know, is it 10%? Is it 15%? Is it 20%? You're, you're asking the wrong question. It's not how much do I have to give. It's what can I give to show him what I think he's worth. You want to be remembered? Don't build monuments, build love. Don't be stingy with your possessions. Share them. Share yourself. Give, 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 give extravagantly in the Lord's name. This is not a fundraising message. In fact, if your attitude is, don't talk to me about that preacher, your money perish with you. If that's the attitude you have, how are you worshiping the Lord? If, if it's, you say, don't talk to me about my money. 
my time, my possessions. Keep them. But you're not worshiping. I don't care how excited you get during the music time. Worship's not conservative. It's extravagant. I, I'm convinced. I've, I've been. I read a. Was reading a book on vacation, which I love to do. Um, the heart of addiction. I, this is this is how we overcome all the garbage in our life. Whether it's addictions, whether it's it's worry, whether it's personal relationships, whatever it is. Uh, here's my answer. If you've got a problem, Jesus is the answer. Learn to worship him. Learn to worship him. Worship means uh, uh, what he wants. It's just all of us. That's all. He just wants all of us. All of our being. In fact, the, the great commandment is love the Lord our God with all our Heart, our soul, and our mind. That, that means with everything you got. Mark 8.35 says, For who, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. Now, we see a, a massive contrast here. And, and again, this is in all of our lives. Contrast between Mary and Judas. Mary's taking, a, 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 taking her, her very treasure and giving it as an act of worship. Judas, on the other hand, says, why? Why don't we sell that for 300 denarii or 300 pence and give the money to the poor? But... The Bible notes that he didn't really want to give the money to the poor. He wanted to give the money to Judas. Are we going to be selfish like Judas or extravagant in our love like Mary? I, again, I, I'm not judging anybody in here. I'm, I'm working on my own life. That's about all I can handle. Ask, we need to ask ourselves some hard questions. Do, do I really love Jesus? Oh, you know, we sing it. Oh, how I love Jesus. We talk about I love Jesus. I, I think, I, I hate to say it, but I think a lot of times we love ourselves and we use Jesus. Do you worship him? It's not always sane or rational, reserved or conservative, but here's the thing. He's worthy. Landon brought this out. Where would we be right now? Right now. If it weren't for Jesus. Fact is, all, all of us right now could be in hell. If it weren't for Jesus. And, and that's what we deserve, folks. I mean, own it. That's what we deserve. Where would we be for eternity if it were not for Jesus? We, we would be in hell for eternity, forever and ever. I know it's not, it's becoming unpopular now to think of, of hell as a place of eternal suffering. But listen, folks, God has this all balanced. If there's a place of eternal bliss, there has to be a place of eternal curse. If, if, there's a, if there is a heaven to be gained, there's a hell to be shown. And Jesus is the one who stepped up to make it possible for us to gain heaven and shun hell. I just think he's worthy of worship. I think he's worthy of an alabaster box of ointment. And more, if we can give. Amen? 
be expressive, break a few costly vases and pour out the contents. If you've not done so, come to him now and give him your heart. It's what he wants. He just wants a relationship, a love relationship with you, like Mary expresses. If you've not done so, come this morning. Somebody knows the Bible, cares about you. They'll sit down in a quiet place. They'll open the Word of God and show you how you can have a relationship with Jesus, how you can shun hell gain heaven. How you can be transformed from a rebel to a worshiper. If you'll come, we'll help you do that this morning.